On this week's broadcast, Sam Ostroff, an interview with a local sculptor as he explains his next piece of art, a 3D metal sculpture of the Northampton skyline. Battle of Seven Pines. Florence gets a 19th century makeover as a Civil War reenactment comes to Look Park. Summer Strings. A summer camp led by camp director Jennifer Gelino provides the youth of Holyoke an opportunity to learn a string instrument. In Focus, a series of in-depth interviews with local entrepreneurs and artists who offer a truly unique experience to our community. Coming to America, local writer and first-time novelist Terry Sachanik talks with us about her new book, Berta DeLuca, the story of a family immigrating to the U.S. at the turn of the 20th century. I'm Corey Schuff, and this is Paradise City Press. Sam Ostroff, who owns Salmon Studios in Florence, Massachusetts, says his success was not overnight. He explains that he started several years ago with a small shop and was only able to sell a couple of pieces at a time, and through those sales he was able to buy more equipment. Sam says the past two years his success has made it so he can do creative metal projects full time. Grew up around metal and machinery, but not necessarily metal sculpture, um, and I've just always been into the creative end of things from very early on, and I had a small metal shop in my parents' basement and started welding early, but did not try and turn this into a business or a career, even consciously ever. It just slowly went in this direction. I love the material. I love working in metal. Um, I feel like, uh, especially with the blacksmithing we were doing earlier, people have been hammering on hot metal for, for an awfully long time, and there's something very um, real and, and physical about that. It's like I want to go into, into metal work and metal sculpture, but try and find the most creative projects we can get our hands on. Ostroff's pieces can be seen all around Western Mass. Along with his creative projects, he's also become known for his signage, doing such venues as Lucky Tattoos and Piercings, Hotel Northampton, and The Hempus. The um, Northampton Planning Department approached us probably nine months ago about designing a new mural, and they had to do their homework to make sure that that the way that they were approaching this and that what they wanted to do was going to work and that was going to be accepted and was, was all okay. Ultimately didn't have this finalized with a signed contract until just a couple of months ago. Um, and, once, and once everything was finalized and was approved, uh, we ordered the materials and started to work on it right away. We're hoping to put it up this fall. There's a lot of work that's left to be done. Um, most of it's figured out, but like we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of details that we still have to, not just details we have to figure out, but we still have to figure out how to actually fabricate what we've drawn in this plan in metal in 3D. And I love that challenge, and it's a lot of fun, but it's, it's a challenge nevertheless. And some of these pieces are really big, and they're really heavy. And just the logistics of moving this around, I mean, I have a big shop, but I mean, you, you look at this and the first thing you say is, well, how are you going to get this out of here? And so we have to build it. We're building it in sections in the shop. Some of those sections are going to get welded together out on the loading dock here. Then we're going to pre-weather it in the parking lot. And once all those pieces are fabricated in one piece, we're going to bring it in town and install it on the bridge. I mean, the basic concept is we're trying to capture the Northampton skyline and all the buildings and all the things that you see downtown. Um, and the way the perspective of this is set up is if you're right in the center of town, almost on the city hall side, looking east on Route 9, you see this row of buildings with commerce and restaurants and shops, which we tried to capture on the left-hand side. Going down, you see the first church, the courthouse. In the background is the Holyoke Range. We even have the Summit House included. Uh, and on the right side, we've got the train station, with which uh, the planning department is going to bring back to life at some point, and they're going to have new train service in Northampton. So that was one of the main criteria they needed to see in this piece. Um, and we kind of had a little creative freedom in how we captured the depot building and put this whole thing together. But the stuff we build here, we put up and we see every day. That also puts an additional stress or level of commitment to make sure that the pieces that are here are really good and that every little detail is something I'm happy with because I'll always notice it. Now we turn to the Battle of Seven Pines. On Saturday, August 11th and Sunday, August 12th, the South will once again rise to battle the Union at the Battle of Seven Pines. 
the Civil War reenactment will be organized and conducted by the folks at Look Park in Florence. From traditional in-character Civil War personalities to skirmish reenactments, 1862 won't seem so far away as it's recreated in our own backyard. We talk with reenactment coordinator Steve Braff, who will be playing Corporal Steve, and Look Park employee Deb Martin, who will be playing Private Augie, as they walk us through the events that will take the town back in time. Deb Martin, I'm uh, Private Augie in the 15th Mass Volunteer Infantry. I'm actually an employee at Look Park, and uh, next weekend, August 11th and 12th, we'll be hosting a Civil War battle reenactment for, for the weekend. And I'm Steve Rapp. I'm, uh, I'm in the 15th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. I'm a corporal, and I've been helping to get all of this put together and, and uh, functioning so that next weekend everybody kind of knows what they're doing. Um, it's going to be over 200 reenactors kind of descending on the park and taking over. Uh, when you come to the park, we hope you're going to get a good interpretation of what it was like to be in 1862. Uh, there'll be a Confederate camp with obviously all the Confederate soldiers there, including artillery. Uh, there'll be a Union camp with all of the federal troops there, including artillery, and they're even going to have the 32nd Mass Hospital Unit, which would be the Civil War, Civil War equivalent of a MASH unit, from like the TV show MASH. Um, so there'll be surgical displays going on. We're going to have uh, engineers there that will show you all of the weapons of mass destruction that were used during the period. Um, and we're also going to have the Unity Camp, and the Unity Camp is the civilian contingent of reenactors. And, and uh, during the war, the wives and daughters of the soldiers would follow the regiments uh, along their battle routes, and they would pretty much take care of their loved ones by doing their cleaning, their clothes cleaning and, and uh, cooking and whatnot. Uh, but we'll have a good interpretation of the civilian people at the time, including there's going to be a fashion show where people will be able to come in and see the, uh, as Augie likes to call them, the hoop skirt wearing reactors. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're, we hope to do a really good uh, depiction of what it was like to be in 1862. A longtime citizen of Northampton, Russ Mayette, um, he was very instrumental. You probably don't remember the Christmas tree on the water. Well, they still have it. But Russ Mayette was very instrumental about getting that. It was a fundraiser that, that they, they did for the city of Northampton. Um, and he was very instrumental in getting the 9th Mass Artillery up and running, and very instrumental in getting the 10th Mass Infantry up and running. So, and he's passed away recently. And so we're going to do a memoriam for him at the dress parade uh, to honor uh, who, his memory and, and his service to the reenactment community. Uh, and then it, uh, that's at 10 o'clock. And then at 11 o'clock, we're going to do um, the Battle at Pines Theater, um, where, why don't you tell them about that one? Because that was kind of your brainchild, you and the captain. The, um, the Union troops will take over the train over at the Petal Belt area. Right. And the train will bring the troops around the park and let them all get off in front of the Pines Theater, where they'll fight and try to defend that the, the Pines Theater as if it was uh, a home. As it, it kind of looks like a Civil War period home. Um, there'll be sharpshooters placed up in the tower in the theater, and um, this, is, this is where everyone, all the everyone that can see in the, the park, what's going on. Um, and then from that we go to the, this is really cool, this is an interaction type of thing. Um, it's called the, um, the Littlest Battalion. And what we're going to do is we're going to enlist uh, kids that come to the park, both Saturday and if they come back Sunday, into uh, what we call the Littlest Battalion. Anybody between the ages of 6 and 12 can participate. Uh, they're going to get a formal muster sheet when they enlist, and they're also going to get a kepi. Now, a kepi was the little Civil War hat, so we're going to make sure that they each get a kepi, and they'll participate in the schooling of the soldiers, so they'll learn how the soldiers actually marched and how they went into battle, and how when they went into battle, they were actually elbow to elbow, and so they were, they were very, very close in, in, in when they went into fight. So we're going to teach them how to do that, and that should be, that should be a whole bunch of fun. Uh, and then that will be followed by the big... A recreation of the Battle of the Seven Pines. When the people come on Saturday morning, um, we'll have as much of the 1862 in place as we possibly can. So. 
but we're hoping we're hoping that a lot of people do come out and a lot of people have a good time. Uh, mm. A lot of the history buffs come out and see what it was like to walk in the brogans of a Civil War soldier. Brogan is the one shoe type uh, shoe that they used to wear back then. Um, so yeah, we're, we're hoping that a lot of people come out and enjoy this. It, we, come, we come Friday and we live like it's the 1860s up until <laughs> Sunday night when we go home. Next, the Summer Strings Program. The program, located in Holyoke, is a nonprofit, cost-free summer camp comprised of roughly 30 pre-kindergarten through 8th grade students. Camp Director Jennifer Gelino describes how the camp began and how it has developed. A violinist for 20 years, Gelino teaches her students how to play the viola, the violin, or the cello through listening and language, eventually adding note reading. Supported mainly by the Friends of Holyoke Public Schools, the camp runs five hours a day, four days a week, all summer long. Jen Gelino offers the reason for the camp's success. I think a lot of people are drawn to strings because it has a really warm, comfortable sound. And especially when you are dealing with youth in urban areas that might also be at risk, the minute they draw their bow against the string, they are given a reward. They succeed every time. <laughs> grown a lot as far as our time of day. It used to be a two-hour camp uh, that was created by a group called Musicorda and at this point it's now mostly supported by a group called Friends of Holyoke Public Schools. Uh, we also get funding from other grants uh, organizations and such and private donors um, and now it's a five-hour camp that includes uh, violin, cello, viola instruction, yoga, chorus, arts and crafts, um, and it's all free to the students of Holyoke. I got involved, let's see, I was attending school at UMass at Amherst, and there was a need for teachers for the camp. And at this point, Holyoke Public Schools had taken it over. Music Corda was no longer in existence, unfortunately. And I started as just a teacher, and the director unfortunately had to leave, so then I got offered that position, and kind of it's been that way ever since. After only playing their instruments for a couple of weeks, the group played to a growing crowd outside of City Hall, made up of some parents, but mostly enchanted passerby. Featured songs included Hot Cross Buns, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and French Folk Song. Before picking up their instruments, however, the Holyoke Summer String Program performed Up Above My Head a cappella. <laughs> listening to pop music um, you're still getting an understanding of time and beat but it's really amazing I always say there's something in the water in Holyoke because all the kids do really well I mean these kids about half of them started in the camp this month they never played a string instrument before and they're already doing a great job this is this is our fourth week of it so there's something in the water <laughs> and it doesn't make sense that they uh, are able to learn this quickly but they do so they're very hard workers and I would even say talented, but I think the fact that they work so hard is the most important thing. Over my head, there's music in the air. There's music in the air. Over my head, over my head, there's music in the air. There's music in the air. Over my head, over my head, there's music in the air.
next, we have the second installment of our In Focus series, which highlights individuals in our town. Northampton is rich with entrepreneurs who work behind the scenes to bring entertainment and the arts to our community. In Focus is an opportunity to briefly get to know your neighbors and the work that they do. Local hair salon, Glamorama, has been a popular beauty shop for many different types of Northampton natives. Salon owner and hairstylist, Rosa Guerra, tells us why Glamorama is a huge part of her life. From the Bronx to Northampton, Guerra has always been passionate about fashion and gives her clients the opportunity to explore their own unique styles. People have walked in here and been like, well, I don't want my hair like you or like her. <laughs> my name is Rosa. I was always interested in style and fashion as a kid. Um, I think as a kid I would have liked to be a fashion designer. I grew up in the Bronx and I had a newborn baby and I was actually living in New Hampshire and I didn't want to go back to the city with the baby. Um, my daughter is 17, she's out of the house, pretty much grown up, so now this is my baby. I actually took over the space from a previous owner. I worked here for two years and she was burnt out looking to get out of the business, so it was either she was going to close the salon or I take over. I technically bought the business for a dollar. All the furniture is new, the walls were white, music is different. We get a lot of creatives, a lot of musicians, artists, writers. What everyone kind of has in common is they're real, because we have clients from 2 to 82. But there's a certain type of person who isn't comfortable, and then there's a certain type of person that isn't comfortable in other salons, but is very comfortable here. I think they come in here and we're not overly styled. Every hair is in place. Everyone I work with is really fun and creative, and it just it feels good to be around everyone that works here and all our clients. It's just, I, I don't even feel like I'm working. Terry Sachanik is a nurse, mother of two, and a first-time novelist. Her book, Bird of DeLuca, chronicles the life of the DeLuca family, Italian immigrants moving from their native Genoa, Italy, to New York City in 1917. The DeLucas fight to endure racism, poverty, and learning English, all to be together as a family. Sachanik's passion for history and fiction inspired her to write the novel. An interview with the author explores the creation of Berta DeLuca and how she balances writing, work, and family. Hello, uh, we're joined today by Terry Suchanik, um, a new author of the book Berta DeLuca. Um, and she was nice enough to join us today uh, to talk about the book and her process and her inspiration. Uh, so, you are a brand new author. This is your first I am. novel? This is my debut novel. Um, I started writing about a year ago, on and off, and um, this is the final, the final product, so I've gotten a lot of good reviews. Excellent, excellent. So this is historical fiction, as, I, as I've been led to believe, and for those at home who might not know, uh, historical fiction, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is uh, when you've got uh, a story and characters that that aren't ne that isn't true that didn't that, that weren't necessarily around at the time but it's in a historical setting so it all could have happened exactly so you know the the events the statistics the institutions all those things are historically accurate and what's plugged into that accurate history are fictitious characters who are moving through that um, that that time in our history so that's uh, that's what makes it incredible because you can um, you can have your characters do anything, and that was uh, an exciting, very exciting time in our history, um, the time period that this book deals with. What kind of research did you do uh, for this book? Well, I tell you this, I, you know, before the advent of the internet, I do not know how anybody wrote a book because they would have to live in the library. Um, even the most minute things, when you're writing about characters, uh, for instance, in an elevator. Well, the elevators in the 1920s are a good deal different than the elevators we have now, so you have to be very careful about all the details and making sure it's authentic. Um, and the internet was a 
a wonderful, wonderful tool because there's just so much information and it's so readily accessible. I also had access to, remarkably, people who were alive then. I'm a registered nurse and I'm um, fortunate that I come into contact with people who were in their 90s and even over 100 years old who could talk to me about the things that they remembered about that time. So that was a that was really um, a terrific help and very interesting. So uh, what was your inspiration for the book? Well, this is not a true story as we talked about earlier. This is historical fiction, but the inspiration for this story was my maternal grandfather's um, coming to this country from Italy as a little boy. He came to Ellis Island with his mother and two younger brothers. Um, and what had happened was his father had been recruited to work in the coal mines in Pennsylvania in the U.S. and he saved up enough money to send for them. And they made their way, the voyage across the Atlantic, which was a tough voyage, and they were being processed through Ellis Island and they were told during the processing that um, his father had been killed in a mining accident. They spoke no English and had very little money and ended up having to make their way in, uh, in this country in New York City. And, uh, you know, times were tough. It was before, you know, social safety nets, before child welfare, before any of those things. And so... Um, it was uh, it was quite a story. Uh, so, uh, Berta De Luca by Terry Sachanik. It's on the bookshelves now and f a bit available for digital download. Uh, thank you so much for being thank with us. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. That's our broadcast for this week. Thank you for being with us. I'm Corey Schuff, reporting from NCTV's studio on Elm Street in Northampton, Massachusetts. Have a good night.